Thank you for that. As we transition to our time of preaching in the Word, uh, I, I want to um, just have a quick introduction. We have been going through the, the book of, of Matthew, and we're in Matthew chapter 24. And for those of you who have been with us, you know that Matthew chapter 24 is a, a time where Jesus speaks about uh, things that are very apocalyptic and cat- cataclysmic. And we've been talking about how often these verses are really confusing and even often misunderstood. Uh, our, our passage today is just one of those passages. I, I warned a couple weeks ago that, yeah, there's going to be a f- you know, two, three straight weeks where we're going to be going through these scriptures and we're going to be seeing, uh, and you may be hearing, something that maybe you've never heard before or something that is not line up with what you have heard before. Um, something that we care a lot about here at our church is rightly dividing the word. And so in these texts today, um, we want to know what did Jesus teach and what did he actually teach, what did he rightly teach, not just what you've heard out there in other churches or other Christians, what do they think or say, but what does Jesus say? We're going to go straight to the source and we're going to use the Bible to help us interpret it rightly. So I pray that as we get into our, our morning sermon that the Lord would help us. In fact, let me pray again for the sermon now and uh, if you'd bow with me. Lord, as we enter into the time of the word, we pray, Lord, that you would speak in and through me, your messenger, but Lord, specifically through your word, that your word is powerful and mighty and as a double-edged sword, Lord, I pray that it would would enlighten us, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. We would be encouraged. We'd be challenged. We'd be challenged to obedience. We'd be challenged to salvation. We'd be challenged to repentance, Lord, that we would hear all the things you want us to hear and none of the things that you don't want us to hear. So, Lord, please be with me and be with us all now, knowing that you are in our presence as we speak. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask if you'd please stand with me as we have the reading of the word this morning. We'll be reading from Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 through 28. And as we often do here, regularly do, I'll read the passage and I can say, this is the word of the Lord once I'm done. And if you could just join me, we could say together, thanks be to God. That's a a good way for us to regularly remind ourselves that we're so grateful to have the scriptures. God made sure we had his word and it's very important that we listen. So this is God's word as read from Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 through 28. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false Prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. And if they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the vulture, wherever the corpse is, There the vultures will gather. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can have a seat now. So we are heading into territory that is often spoken of and often, unfortunately, misunderstood. How much have you heard about the Great Tribulation? How much have you heard of the abomination that causes desolation? How much have you heard of uh, the idea of a future temple? that God will erect, or the idea of a secret rapture, that God will come to take his people away. Um, Many of these teachings have been and are popular in these days and have been for about the last 150 150 years or so. 
And many of the people who espouse those teachings will use these particular verses to ground them. They'll say in Matthew chapter 24 that verses 4 through 14, what we just had yesterday, represents general tribulation in the last seven years of, of earthly history before Jesus comes back, and that these verses today that we're going over, these will be the great tribulation, the second half of a seven-year period of, in which there will be much difficulty. And unfortunately, as we take our time going through verse by verse, line by line, what the scriptures have to say and comparing them with what the other scriptures have to say, not reading them out of context or not reading things into them, we'll see that there is no secret rapture or there is no seven-year period to speak of in these verses. Um, that is something that does not, it's not appropriate to be able to take from these verses. Let me remind you and remind us where we've been so that we can rightly interpret the word. We have to read things in context. We have to read things in their normal units that God gives them to us, not out of context. Uh, the two questions that have been asked, remember, Jesus comes in, he just, in chapter 23, he rebukes Israel, he rebukes the leaders of Israel, and he prophesies the destruction of their temple. And he says all these things will happen in their generation. Well, at the, at the beginning of chapter 24, he says, this, these, all these stones of the temple will be, be thrown down. And that's when these disciples ask questions. When will these things be talking about, Jesus talk, is talking about the destruction of the temple, and they say, when is that going to happen? When will these things happen? But they add another question, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And as we talked about before, an important interpretive clue is to answer the question, were the disciples correct in adding that to the questions, or were they incorrect? Uh, were they right to see that the destruction of the temple would be ultimately the end of the earth, the end of the age, or were they wrong about that? And what we've been saying this whole time is Jesus doesn't, um, doesn't seem to be affirming their understanding that the end of the world will be when the destruction of, of Jerusalem happens. Why? Because immediately he says, don't get duped. Don't be led astray. There's lots of things that'll be happening. There'll be tribulation. There'll be false messiahs. There'll be famines. There'll be wars. These are just the beginning of birth pains. The end is not yet. He, he actually tries to calm them and say, I, you're misunderstanding the teaching about the end. It's true. The destruction of temple is a significant part of Israel's history, some of the most significant, but he actually tries to untie their misunderstanding. And what we've said is, that he is going to speak about these things, which are the destruction of the temple. If we go to the next slide, we see that from Matthew chapter 23, verse 36, all the way to chapter 24, verse 35, he's now going to be talking about the, the things related to the destruction of the temple. And after that, he's then going to be addressing their issue about his coming back at the end of the age the end of, uh, end of the world. And so last week, what does he say? See that no one leads you astray, verses four through eight. You will be delivered up to tribulation. It's, you're gonna go through lots of persecution, but stay focused, proclaim the gospel to all nations. All of this is gonna be happening before the destruction of the temple. He basically says, don't get duped uh, by what's going on there. Stay focused, be about the gospel proclamation. Be about that. Let me read to you what one commentator said that I thought was helpful about these verses that we're going to get into. Secret rapture? What about it? It says, Whose library, whole libraries have been written on the subject of the so-called secret rapture, debating whether it will take place before or after the Great Tribulation. Will the church go through the tribulation or will it be taken away before or even during this worldwide trial? Will Christ's secret return for his church be pre-tribulation, post-tribulation, or mid-tribulation, remembering that these, all these things were to happen before that generation passed away, we may say that the, this whole concept of a secret rapture being related to the great tribulation is unbiblical. What Jesus is referring to is the sufferings of the Jews under the Roman attack, and particularly those of the inhabitants of Jerusalem during the Roman siege. These verses are actually verses that were prophecy to the, to the disciples at their time. It was future for them, but they're fulfilled prophecy for us. 
okay? It was future to them, but fulfilled prophecy for us. Why? Because Jesus explicitly taught that all these things needed to happen but in their generational time. We see that in uh, chapter 23, verse 36, and we see that in chapter 24, verse 35. And so that's the group that we put together, that this all has to happen before they die, or in this generation. So now let's read the text, and really, what is Jesus going to do? In this text, he's actually going to answer their first question. When will these things happen? The first part, remember he says, don't worry, don't get duped, stay focused. He doesn't actually tell them when it's going to happen in the first section, but now he's going to tell them when these things will happen. He's going to actually answer their question. And so starting in verse 15, when would the destruction of the temple, these things take place? Here's the answer. So when you see, he now shifts. So, meaning the word therefore, what did he just say? Don't get duped. There's false prophets. Therefore, so when you, not future uh, generation, he's talking to his disciples. When you disciples see with your own eyes, meaning it already happened, it's going to happen back then, the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, he says, let the reader understand, meaning you must actually read the book of Daniel and understand what the book of Daniel is talking about to understand what you'll be seeing in their time. You must understand Old Testament prophecy to understand what they're going to be seeing. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Jesus, when will these things be? When will the destruction of the temple take place? He goes, it won't happen like you think. Don't be led astray. There's all kinds of crazy things that are going on, earthquakes and famines and all these things. Don't get duped by false prophecies and, and false messiahs. No, that's just the beginning. Stay focused. Keep preaching the gospel. But when you do see the abomination that causes desolation or the abomination of desolation that Daniel speaks about, you need to understand Daniel and understand, understand what you are going to be seeing. What does he say? Run for the hills. Run for the mountain when you see the abomination of desolation. Now, for many of us, we're not super familiar, not all of us, some of us maybe, but we're not all familiar with what the abomination of desolation means. Like, what is that? Um, well, it's going to be talking about a time in, in Daniel. Actually, if we can go to the slide that talks about that, abomination that causes desolation, um, there, that phrase is used four times in the book of Daniel, and it's in the prophetic part. There's a part of Daniel that is not necessarily prophetic. It's actually talking about what's going on in the life of Daniel and in the life of Nebuchadnezzar, and it's actually historical, and it's supposed to tell you about the sovereignty of God in the midst of his people in, in the pagan nations. But then it shifts to a time of prophecy, chapters 7 through 12, and what we see is in those chapters 7 through 12, there are four specific times where this idea of an abomination that causes desolation is mentioned. Uh, Daniel 8, 13, 9, 27, 11, 31, and 12, 11. So it's clearly a Danielic, if you want to say it, Danielic idea. And please bear with me. We need to actually go through the teaching of these things to rightly understand our passage for today. So today will be a little bit more heavy on the teaching side. I think just by necessity of trying to understand what Jesus meant, we're going to have to do a little bit of work here. So God is with us. He'll get us there. So let's do it. Well, what we find out through history and through um, fulfilled prophecy is that actually Daniel was talking about different kingdoms of his age that were, uh, that were going to take place in his future that have already happened in our past. Different kingdoms of the, Pe uh, the, the, the Persians and the Medes and the Greeks and the Romans, and, and there's different... Uh, kingdoms that were prophesied with different, uh, different dynamics that were going on. Well, the abomination that causes desolation is this idea that something gross, polluting, filthy, the idea of abomination, something that's absolutely disgusting, was going to take place that brought about desolation or desecration or destruction. And, and it talks about in the holy place, which would have been in the holy city of Jerusalem and at the holy place, the temple. And so Daniel talks about this idea. There's going to be essentially non-Jewish, pagan, gross, idolatrous things happening where it should never happen. 
the temple of God. And what we know from is that at least three, if not all of the four, of those uh, references of Daniel and the abomination that causes desolation were fulfilled already in a, a Greek leader named Atticus Epiphanes, and it happened in the year 167 BC. What did he do uh, when, when Israel was going into exile, when they were under the judgment of God? What happened? God often uses pagan kings and empires to punish his people. Uh, and so what happened? Antiochus Epiphanes takes over the temple, this, this um, commanding leader. He prohibits and stops the Jewish sacrifices that were to happen, and he sets up pagan altars in the, the temple and pagan, so that pagan sacrifices can happen in the temple, even pagan sacrifices that included sacrificing of pigs which would have been the absolute, you know, dirty. It, this was so wrong to all of the Jewish teaching. This is so wrong. And so we know that this has already happened. And what Jesus is saying, and first of all, Jesus knows that his disciples already know this because we can know about uh, what happened in Antiochus Epiphanes because it's written about in the book of Maccabees. And Maccabees was a major... Um, the, the, the family of the Maccabees ended up being about a Jewish revolt, which helped take back the temple, helped take back what, what had already happened. And actually, uh, if you know anything about Jewish history in this called intertestamental period in between the Testaments, um, you've, you've heard of Hanukkah, right? Hanukkah. Well, Hanukkah is, is a Jewish traditional holiday that is actually celebrated because of the war that took place in the Jewish Maccabee era. era. And it's, it's related to kind of the taking back of, of what happened in Antiochus Epiphanes. Jesus knows that they already know this, and he goes, hey, the abomination that when you see the abomination and desolation, Matthew's talking to a Jewish uh, audit, uh, audience, and Jesus is, is uh, speaking these words. He's saying, when you see a pagan go in and do something gross and desecrate the holy place, that's when you know the sign is. And so... That's what he's going to talk about. Now, actually, how do we know this to be the case? Jew, uh, Matthew is talking to a Jewish audience, and so he's going to use Daniel's language, right? But what about other uh, Gospels? Luke, he wasn't writing, he wasn't a Jew, and he wasn't writing to a Jewish audience. Let's look at the exact same passage in Luke and, and what it says compared to Matthew and Luke actually becomes an interpretive grid to us to tell us what the abomination of desolation actually meant. Let's read it here. It's the exact same thing. should sound familiar, but look what Luke says. But when you see Jerusalem, Luke 21, starting verse 20, surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains." Notice how Matthew says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, Jewish readers go look to Daniel. What does Luke say? When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, he tells you what the abomination of desolation is. It's this pagan nation surrounding the holy city. This is what the abomination of desolation is. Luke tells you what it means. And by the way, that's not some future thing. It already happened. You see? Um, know that you are to flee to the mountains. Those who are in Judea, those who are surrounded by these armies, get out of there. That is when you, when you know things are going to get crazy. So now that we've sort of understand and we looked at Scripture to interpret Scripture, and we, you know, we look at the Old Testament and we look at the New Testament, and it all talks about itself. Okay, if this is all past history, what does that matter to us? Why, 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 does it, why does it matter? Well, let's ask these. What do these verses mean for us today? It's this. If you're taking notes, this may be helpful for you. What can we learn about these things today? It's that we must urgently flee the wrath of God to come. We also must understand that what was going on in their day was that God was pouring out his wrath on the nation of Israel. Why? Because they were idolaters 
They were apostate. They did not believe in God. They did not follow Jesus. God sent his only son to save them. He sent them their long-awaited Messiah, and they rejected the Messiah, and therefore God will reject them and was rejecting them, pouring out his wrath on them, just like he said he would do in the Old Testament if they rejected him. Well, guess what? There's also a future wrath to come for the rest of the world. And so even though this was a past completed event, there still is coming wrath for people who are on earth. And we must take the same lesson or of a similar way just for our time. We, we must urgently flee. In the same way that they needed to urgently flee from what was going on in their time, we need to make sure that we're not caught up in the wrath of God either. Look at what it says in verse 17 of our passage. Again, talking about them and their time, and we'll apply it to us. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in this house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. What is he saying? If you see the army surrounding Jerusalem, don't take your time. Get out of there. The wrath of God is coming. This is what Jesus is saying to his disciples who actually lived through this. Some of them were alive, uh, and, and some of them were actually dead by this time. Peter was likely dead by this time. Uh, he was w- one of the earlier ones to die of the apostles and the disciples, but there were other disciples who were there. There were other Christians who needed to hear this word. Um, and so what we see is that we actually know that the armies surrounded Jerusalem in the year AD 66. And it did start this terrible time. In fact, let me go back to a, a previous slide, which described just how Jerusalem was torn apart. It says, Jerusalem was torn apart. Let me Read this to you. It says, The Jewish revolt began in 66 AD. And during 67 to 68, the Roman commander Vespasian conquered most of Palestine. The Roman civil war in 68 and 69 led to a suspension of military operations in the east. But during that period, Jerusalem was torn apart by its own civil war as different Jewish parties battled for control with the temple, the inner courts controlled by the zealots under Eleazar, and the outer courts controlled by John of Giscala at the center of the fighting. When eventually the Roman attack resumed in 69, Jerusalem was already in in a weakened and demoralized state. When Vespasian returned to, to Rome to take up his new office as emperor, his son Titus put Jerusalem under siege for five terrible months until the temple and much of the city were destroyed in the fall of 70 AD. What was going on in their time? God's wrath was coming on the nation of Israel for their rejection of of Jesus the Messiah. And and what happened? Jesus gave them the sign. When you see the abomination of desolation or the armies are surrounding, flee for the hills. Don't wait around. You're going to get swept up in a war. That's going to kill many, many, many people. And from the time that we can tell between this 66 and uh, 70 AD, there are different numbers that have been thrown around, but one of the most um, kind of attested to was that there were at least 1.1 million Jews that were killed during this time, Um, both from the Roman armies as well as the Jews themselves were killing themselves. Um, they, They took, in order to not have the Rome take uh, the temple, they, the Roman armies pushed people back, and there was fighting factions within uh, Jerusalem and within the temple. Like we said here, there were zealots on one side, and there was John of Gascala on another, and they were, it was brutal. They were killing each other. They were, they were, um, they, they, they poisoned the water. They, people were, their famines were going on. When there's no water, there's no food to go through. Uh, people get crazy. They, they sell their, their kids into slavery. Um, some reports of even uh, mothers eating their children. I mean, it was just a terrible, terrible time. And so what is going on here? This is God sending his wrath and warning them to urgently flee the wrath. In fact, in verse 19, there's kind of this compassionate woe. Verse 19 of 24, it says, And alas, for women who are pregnant and, and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be on a winter or on a Sabbath. He's saying it's going to be so bad for the women who are nursing. And for those on Sabbath, Sabbath was a time when people would not travel. And so people were not hospitable. They weren't out and about. People would shut things down. And you're not going to get help that you need. 
If it's in the winter, you won't be able to pass the, the roads. You're going to the mountains. The mountains will have snow and ice, and the, the rivers will be swollen, and it'll be terrible if you do it through, through the winter. People will die just trying to get out of the place. It's incredible. Charles Spurgeon remarks on this, also saying this is not about a future time. I appreciate his, his comments here. He says that this portion of our Savior's words appears to relate solely to the destruction of Jerusalem. As soon as Christ's disciples saw the abomination of desolation, that is the Roman ensigns and their idolatrous emblems standing in the holy place, they knew that it was time for them to escape, uh, had arrived, and that they had to flee to the mountains. The Christians in Jerusalem and the surrounding towns and villages in Judea availed themselves to the, at the first opportunity for eluding destruction, which overthrew the Jews. Here's the good news. Christians who heard these words actually paid attention to them and actually got out before it was too late. Good news. Christians believed Jesus' words and didn't go through the, the crazy siege that uh, other people who didn't heed his words went through. Uh, this happened. There was a, a city named Pella. There was apparently a report uh, from Eusebius, an early Christian father who said that uh, a man named Simon led many people away to a city called Pella and led uh, so that they ended up getting saved right when they heard about this taking place. It was an incredible fulfillment of prophecy and incredible obedience to Christ's words. So it says, there it was no time to spare before the final investment of the guilty city. The man on the housetop could, could not come down to take anything of his house, and the man in the field could not return back to take his clothes. They must flee to the mountains in the greatest haste that moment that they saw Jerusalem encompassed by armies. So what does this mean for us? It means that there is a wrath to come that we must flee from. It means that Jesus is coming back at the end of, of our history. We know this is talking about them and their Jewish history, but Jesus promised in other places that he's going to come back and only those who are his will be saved. Only those who believe in Jesus Christ will be saved. Only those who confess their sins, repent, who obey Christ, and who live a life that show that they're in Christ, those who are actually in Christ, not not those who just were born in a Christian home, not those who just go to church a few times, not those who have Christian parents or pastors or who are, who are in your family. It's those who actually have a saving relationship with Christ who will be saved from the wrath to come. That's what we must do. We must run to Christ ourselves. As we go on in this passage, um, we see the, one of the parts that are often misunderstood. It's this term, the great tribulation. Verse 21, we understand why it could be misunderstood because it's such, such large language, such emphatic language. Verse 21 says, For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been from the beginning of the world until now and known will never be. And if you read these verses, which many people have, and take them kind of at face value, it makes sense why you might say, wow, this must be the worst of the worst, and nothing will ever happen like it before, nothing ever again. Wow, this must be the end of the world, right? If you take it at face value. The question is, what does Jesus mean when he says these words? Is your assumption what he meant? Or are there other clues in the scripture that we can say that maybe it wasn't talking about the end of the world? We know he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Let me show you some scriptures here to get through some of these thorny questions that I actually believe that this is just, if I could say rank and file, stock, normal, prophetic language. Jesus was the prophet of prophets. He knew the prophecies of the Old Testament. And if we go into the Old Testament, we're going to see this phrase repeated again and again and again and again. What was Jesus doing? He was prophesying. What was he prophesying? Judgment. What kind of judgment? Judgment of a terrible sort. And that's what this language is going to show us. Let me show you in Exodus, Exodus eleven six, There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been, nor ever will be again. Sound familiar? That's uh, prophetic judgment language. How about Exodus ten fourteen? 
And the locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt. Such a, a dense swarm of locusts had never been before and will never be again. How about Joel chapters 2, verses 1 and 2? Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy hill. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. Verse 2, and a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people, like there has never been before, nor will there be again after them through the years of all their generations. How about Ezekiel 5, 9? And because all of your abominations I will do with you and what I have never done yet, uh, yet done, and the like of which I will never do again. How many times does God say, it's never been this bad and it'll never be this bad again? Before you go, wait a minute, did you like top the last one? Or like, uh, so, wait, so wait, so now we're at the worst of the worst? Like, which I'm, I'm hard keeping track here. Maybe we're supposed to understand that the Bible talks in certain ways and not misunderstand things by surface reading them and understand that Jesus is actually using prophetic language to prove a point that says there's going to be a terrible judgment. I'm serious. <laughs> it's going to be the worst. Not joking. Like, it's prophetic language. Jesus is the prophet of prophets. He knows the Old Testament. So what is going on here? Jesus is telling us to flee the wrath to come, just like he told them. So let me ask you now, have you urgently fled God's wrath by running to Christ? Have you, sitting in this seat now, this morning, have you understood that your life without Christ is like a train heading off of a cliff? And off of that cliff is going to land in the wrath of God. Because of our sin, because of our selfishness and idolatry, because we're of our blasphemous ways, because we, 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 we lie and steal, because we are impure in our thoughts, because we, we, we cheat others, because we're envious, because we're proud, because we're lazy, because of all these things that are unrighteous and unworthy of Christ. Are you aware that it's only through Christ that you can be saved? I pray that you have, and I know that many of us have. And so I run to Christ. Believe in Christ. He's the only way. There is no other way. There's no Buddha or Islam. There's no other way but to Christ. And so this is not just for the unbeliever. It is for the unbeliever. Let me show in Revelation 16, or Revelation 6, that it is talking about the, the believer, but it's all, the unbeliever, and it's also for the believer. Let me, let me start in Revelation 6. It says, Then the kings of the earth, talking about the future coming judgment of God, and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and the everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks and the mountains. Verse 16, calling to the mountains. What are, the, what are all these people calling to the mountains and the rocks? Fall on us and hide us from the... Fi- from the face of him who is seated on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb. This is talking about Jesus coming in wrath. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? This is a future prophecy of what will happen. But it's not just for the unbeliever. The unbeliever needs to say, Christ is king. I am sinner. Please, Lord, I, I hear your invitation to be forgiven and my need to confess I, I need that, I want that. Take me into your kingdom, Christ. Every, every non-believer needs to be converted. They need to believe in Christ. They need to be baptized. They need to follow the commands of Christ. They need to be brought into the church and then they need to be discipled in what Christ says must be done in every single part of our life. It's not get saved and get fire insurance and then just do whatever I want from there. It's get saved from the wrath to come and now we belong to Christ and we do whatever he calls us to the good, the hard, and everything in between. The believer also must flee from the wrath to come. Many of us standing, sitting here now must also flee of the wrath. Look what Ephesians 5 says. But sexual, sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among us, among you, who? The Christians, as is proper among saints, he says. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. 
Oh, Christian, have you let the world back into your life and into your heart? Have you let filthiness and grossness and lewdness and selfishness back into your heart by the power of the Spirit, because you love Christ, push back on the sin that we so easily wrestle with? Verse 5, it says, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, who is covetous, even if you just want something that belongs to someone else, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Verse 6, let no one deceive you, Christian, with empty words. Easy believism. Oh, you prayed a prayer when you were five or six? That's good enough. God's got you good. Don't let anyone deceive you. Don't let anyone deceive you. For because of these things, these sins that we are to renounce and to remove from our life, it's because of these sins that the things of the wrath of God has come upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. We also must flee the wrath who is to come, not worrying about Christ, or knowing that Christ ultimately took our wrath, but knowing that we must continue to love him and obey him and trust him by living a holy and pure life so we can be with him. Good news, Christ is our good savior, high priest, king, who knows our struggles and who died to help us in our struggles. So if you are a Christian here this morning who struggles and feels stuck in sin, flee the wrath to come by running to Jesus' arms and saying, Jesus, help me with my besetting sin. Help me with my wrong thoughts. Help me with my despair. Help me. I don't want to fall back into those things. And he says, come to me. Come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, I will help you. I'll give you rest. Good news. Good news. Jesus is a good Savior. And he doesn't bring his wrath on us. He took all the wrath for us. Amen? Let's look at this next point here. First is we must urgently flee the wrath to come. Our next point of how this helps us is the Lord does spare his elect and he does give them mercy from his wrath. Praise the Lord. The Lord spares his elect and he gives them mercy from his wrath. Look at in verse 22. This one verse is so actually encouraging and helpful. It says, if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. It would have been terrible. Literally, everybody around there would have been killed. It would have been just an absolute massacre, nothing left. This is how bad it was. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. You know what Jesus says here about the days of AD 70? It could have been so much worse than the more than a million people who got massacred. It could have been way worse. But actually, God in his love and his mercy for his people chose to limit his wrath, to to cut short his wrath so that he can make more space for his people. In fact, you're like, what exactly does that mean? You know, as I wrestled and worked through this, it it actually, there was a couple people that were helpful in pointing things out, but it makes sense that what does it mean for the sake of his elect? He cut those days short. It means that there were Jews in those times who were going to be left alive because either they weren't converted yet, their elect who weren't converted yet at that moment, but they were going to be converted later on in life, or that there were children from those Jews who weren't born yet who needed to be born. And in order for those elect people to be born in the future, their parents needed to stay alive. And so God cut down the judgment on the city of Jerusalem so that his elect could ultimately get saved. It's a wonderful doctrine, actually. You know, many of us are scared of the wrath to come, which is appropriate. But if you are on, if God, if you are on God's side, we actually see his mercy and his grace and his care for his elect, even in the midst of the most terrible things. He's always guarding his elect. It doesn't mean that his elect won't go through hard things. It doesn't mean that they won't not, they'll be guarded from all persecutions. No, Jesus warns that they'll be going through persecutions. They'll be delivered up, and they'll, they'll eventually die. But God, in the midst of all of that, is leading and guiding history sovereignly, so that exactly everything happens the way he wants it, and it's for his glory and for his elect's good. And so he cuts his his wrath short 
so that its elect could have more space. It's incredible. This is not the only time this idea has been brought up. Verse, 1 Thessalonians 5 says this, uh, verse 9 and 10, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. God has not destined us for the same wrath that other people get. Praise the Lord. That is not deserved. That is not deserved. But he is so kind. Look what Romans 9, 5 says. Since therefore we now have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from, his wrath, from the wrath of God. God saves us from his wrath through his mercy. And so let me ask you, how often do you praise God for his mercy in your life? How often are you aware of, oh, the Lord is constantly saving me from things that I should be experiencing because of my sin? He is a good God through, his, through Jesus, through the Spirit, through his angels. I just finished a class on angels this week, and it's incredible to know what the Bible has to say about how God sends angels to protect his people at every waking moment. There are angels around us all the time working for God to help his elect. It's incredible. God loves us and protects us. I'm encouraged that we read together the the scripture from Ephesians 2 this morning. It's fitting to bring it up now talking about who we once were. It says, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh is our sinful flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we're by nature, we are all by nature children of wrath in our sinfulness like the rest of mankind. But verse four is so important, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead and our trespasses made us alive together with Christ, by, the, by grace, you have been saved. Oh, Christ has judgment, but Christ has mercy. Christ has mercy. May we love God and thank God for his merciful dealings with us. His mercies are new every morning. It's been a regular pattern of mine throughout the years to, with, with all the intention and prayer in my heart to, upon first waking up, to breathe in my first breath of conscious air and say, thank you for today. Thank you for new mercies today. I don't, I'm not owed another day. He gave me another one. Start the day out with thankfulness of God's mercy. Let's look at our last point for this morning. What are we to learn today about this passage? Knowing that it was fulfilled in the past, but it still has relevance for today, well, we must urgently flee the future wrath to come by finding salvation in Christ alone. And we must be so grateful for the fact that God spares his chosen people from wrath through his mercy. We must be thankful for that. Let's look at our last point. It's that we must reject false Christs and instead don't believe them, believe Christ, believe the real Christ and heed his true words. Look what it says in verse 23. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or there he is, do not believe it. Don't listen to those false Christs, those false prophets, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect, meaning there will be be teachers and there will be people who do things. By the way, when it says false, uh, perform great signs and wonders, people and demons do not have the ability to do miracles like God. We just need to clear this up. Satan is not an equal to God. He does not have all power. He does not have all knowledge. He does not have the ability to do miracles. He's a fallen angel. But what he can do is trick people and deceive people. You don't even need to be a devil to be able to trick people. Just go to a magic show. How many times have you been deceived? How many times have you been duped? How many times have you been, how do you do that? Wow. Guess what? Whenever we see false signs and wonders, they're just that, false. They're not true. They dupe people. And some of them are so actually compelling that even some Christians get duped. Now, Christians, good news, Christians won't ultimately get duped in such a way that they won't make it to heaven. Christ is guarding us. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. 
But we can get duped by individual moments and individual teachings and individual people. And so what is he calling us to do here? Be careful, extra vigilant in our understanding of the word of Christ so that when we see an imposter, hear an imposter, we know the original, we know the true voice, and we say, what does Christ say? What does Christ say? I believe what Christ says. Everything goes back to what Christ says in his word. Verse 25 Look what he says. Don't believe these false prophets. Verse 25 says, see, I have told you beforehand. Don't believe them. Believe me. When you see the armies surrounding, Luke says, run for the hills. Don't believe those false guys. Believe me. Believe what I, and it's the people who believe Christ who get saved. It's the people who heed his words who get blessed. It's incredible. Verse 26, so if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. I just have to make this comment here. It is very common for doomsdayers, for people who are concerned about the apocalypse, concerned about something terrible happening, what do they say? Go out into the wilderness and segregate yourself from the rest of society and, and uh, you know, get their safety away from the people. Go into the wilderness. We have this around in our day, too. Just go get a bunch of land and have nobody be around you and just live the life separated from other people because you can control your own safety if you go into the wilderness. Jesus is saying, don't listen to that kind of talk where you're selfishly trying to get away from all things that you think are going to hurt you. And then look at the other thing. Don't go into the inner rooms. You know what might be a modern translation of that? Don't get a bunker. Don't follow guys into the bunker who say, he's out there. No, he's in here. He's in here. Don't listen to the voices of alarmism and extremism. Listen to Christ. And Christ says, if you love me, if you follow me, if you believe me in my words, your life will be built on the rock. And so in verse 27 and 28, he's going to make a contrast here. He's going to make a contrast between what the other false prophets are saying uh, and what he is saying and what it's going to be like when he truly does come. Verse 27, For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. When the vulture, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. You know, as we talk about these last verses, it's true that these last verses are some of the harder ones to understand, especially right off the surface. What, what are you talking about here? Jesus is talking about not listening to these false prophets, but listen to Jesus well, what is he saying? He, he's, he's saying that, hey, people are going to be talking about doomsday. Don't follow them. It's not actually time for Christ to return yet. He's going to return in judgment on Jerusalem at that point, but people are going to be talking about the end of the world. Don't follow those false, false messiahs. In fact, I just was reminded again of, maybe you'll remember from the late 20, 2010s, Harold Camping. Do you remember that guy who, who it was like 2011 and uh, in 2012, 2014, and he, he kept saying the end of the world was coming. And the first one was, was May 21st, 20, uh, 2011. He, he went off some Old Testament thing about um, Noah and the ark needed to return to the ark in seven days. So he quotes Genesis and goes, seven days, wait a minute. Peter says, a day is just a thousand years. So that must mean Exactly 7,000 years from the day of the flood, Jesus is coming back. It must be. That's, that's an example of bad hermeneutics, bad interpretation. Don't do that. Don't listen to people who do that. There's right ways to interpret Scripture. There's wrong ways to interpret Scripture. And what happens? We have these doomsdayers who get it wrong. He says, no, when I come back, it'll be like lightning that everybody can see everywhere. It's not going to be some, by the way, this is against a secret rapture too. Everybody's going to see it from the east to the west. Everybody will know it. It's not some secret thing. That'll be the coming of the Son of Man. But he goes, but when you see the corpse, there the vultures were gathered. Now he brings them back. He says, hey, Israel's going to look like a corpse. It's going to be dead on the ground. And what are you going to see? A bunch of vultures around it. What does that mean? Well, actually, the word for vulture is the same word for eagle, and it would have very much understood this to be the pagan sign of the Roman Empire was the eagle, was the vulture. It's actually the same word. And it's like, look, these false messiahs are going to be saying the end of the world is here. And he's like, no, 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 it's not going to be something like they're saying. 
Trust me, everybody will know when I come back. But when you see the corpse, when you see Israel, know that it, their time is done. And so with this last quote, I was helped here. It says, if they are confronted with these false claims to be the Christ, they can know it, that it is not true. The time is not yet come for Christ to return. So if anyone tells you, there he is out in the desert, do not go out. Or if they tell you in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For such, is coming in the des- for, for such a coming in the desert or in the inner rooms is private and secret. Certainly, it does not accord with what will be true of Christ really when he, comes, when he does come. This does not contradict the principle in, in verse 34, which is that all this will happen in the generation. Jesus is just comparing the difference between what Jesus truly says about his end versus what they say about the end. And he says, Jesus is stating that it will not happen during this period. On the contrary, what, when Jesus does return, it will be obvious and clear to everyone. For as the lightning comes from the east and is visible to, in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. He will say, more about this in the second part of his discourse, but for the moment, his concern is that his disciples and the first century Christians should not be deceived by false claims. When Christ does does come, there will be no question, no doubt. It'll be obvious to all, and he will be seen by everyone. So how should we conclude our time? We must ask this question. Are you firmly committed to believing and obeying all the words of Christ? Are you firmly committed not to... Not to, to believe what you hear out there in any, any old Christian teacher or what's online or what's on TV. No, no, no. Are, do you have a relationship with Christ and do you have your, his spirit in you? And are you a part of a, a, a godly, a true church in which you can be taught and help discern what Jesus does say so that we can't get duped and so we can live righteous lives, right lives, the way Christ wants us to live? Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like wise men who build his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Brother, sister, friend, these verses often misunderstood actually are very helpful to us. Christ is the most important thing in everyone's life. We must seek him and him alone. We must take his words seriously. We must run to Christ for salvation, forgiveness, and security, not to money or power or knowledge or work or prestige. We should run to Christ, and we should listen to every word he has to say, being very discerning about false teaching out there. Would you bow your head with me? Jesus, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your training us in righteousness. Thank you for warning us against things that we are so susceptible to falling into. And Lord, for being merciful to prolong our days and lives and to save us from the wrath to come. We pray that many more of your elect, many more people will come to faith will know the truth of who you are and receive you by faith and love you and obey you from the heart. So Lord, please help us to do that here and now as a church. And may we be a church that can welcome many, many more people who also will come to faith and grow in the knowledge of you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen.